So let me invite you to look there with me, Revelation 19. And I'm going to read for us from verse 11 down to verse 21 and speak with you on this other supper that we find described here. We've just considered together the marriage feast of the Lamb up in verse 9 where it says, Blessed are they which are called, actually the called, summoned unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, that Lamb that God has purposed to glorify and honor His own Son. And yet we read here in verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Again, we're talking about symbolic language. I hope that's pretty evident as we've gone through the book of Revelation. There's not a flying horse floating around up there waiting to be ridden and brought in. But a horse was a type of power and authority. Back in the day, it was the primary means of going to battle. And so we see here a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That can't be said of anyone but the Lord Jesus Christ. I know men like to think of themselves as faithful and true, but let God be true, and every man a liar is the way the scriptures put it. This is a, a definition that is describes only the Son of God, and if Scripture refers to any of his own as faithful and true. It's only because of that righteousness imputed in the Son. Because he's faithful and true, God looks upon his own as faithful and true. Not necessarily in their experience, but by imputation. And it says here, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. These words are important. There are people today who contest a constant preaching of the righteousness of God. They say we need to move on. We need to talk more about experience and just stop talking so much about the righteousness of God. Well, like it or not, you're going to have to deal with the righteousness of God. Every day that goes by, every second that ticks, we are one tick closer to having to deal with this righteous God. The world will be judged in righteousness by this one. So we better know something about it. It's like preparing for a court case. If you have an issue that is outstanding in court, every day that goes by, your mind is on that matter being settled. And if it's not settled, when you get into that courtroom, you're going to know something of the authority and wrath of the judge. You're going to know something of condemnation. So that's why it's vital. If I thought in any way our experience entered into our acceptance with God, I'd preach more experience. But I know that experience is just like emotions. One day we're up, one day we're down. It's just like a, a being tossed out on the sea. Today I believe, tomorrow I don't. Today I say I have faith, tomorrow I'm down. I'm so thankful it's not based on experience, but a righteousness that has been established and accepted and imputed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we read here, in righteousness he doth judge. If you want to know on what standard God judges, here it is, the righteousness of his son. And make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. That's an interesting terminology. I think we think we know everything there is to know about Christ. You ever talk to somebody and you get kind of cocky with them and say, well, I know everything there is to know about you? Oh, really? What was my childhood name? Only those that are intimately acquainted with you are going to be able to know and discern that. It's just not something that is commonly known. I believe 
what it's revealing here is that there are aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ as much as we know about him and profess to know, yet we still do not know. Yet to be discovered, revealed, you see. Here it is, a name written that no man knew, no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in white and fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath his vesture, or on his vesture, and on his thigh a name written, I like all caps here. King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. Come and gather yourselves together. Here it is. Unto the supper of the great God. You can see this in contrast to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Both called suppers but two distinct suppers that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men both free and bond both small and great and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. You know, if there's any doubt in anyone's mind about the sovereignty and the power and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory over his enemies, I would say read this particular portion of Scripture. If you don't believe anything else, read this and consider what is set before us. It's not that there haven't been sufficient evidences of his ruling, but here we read of the great and the final and the glorious victory that he will exercise over those who followed the beast and the false prophet. Revelation chapter 13 represents the evil government of men that oppose the truth, oppose the gospel, to worship they call it religious freedom, and yet, in reality, it's religious rebellion against the gospel, against the truth, against Christ. They keep watering down ways that they say things in order to make it palatable to men. Even prayers that are so-called prayers that are addressed in our legislature today are addressed to an almighty or to a, a man upstairs or to some unnamed God because we don't want to offend the Hindus, we don't want to offend the Buddhists, we don't want to offend the Muslims. And anybody can rationalize that sort of thinking right on down to, to water the soup until there's nothing left. And, you know, let's don't be fooled by presidential candidates that use religious jargon and slogans in order to win votes and to somehow gain favor with people. We live in an evil day. You can talk all you want to about communist countries, but as I consider and weigh the ignorance that there is with regard to Christ and the truth and the beast that religion has ridden on to get to this point, we're a far cry from being a Christian nation. Far cry. And the day may come where we face opposition where we face persecution even for making such a statement. It may come in our day. 
It has in the past. Why would we think we're any different? But nonetheless, that beast is alive and well. I know it because you notice here, and the false prophet is nothing more than religious leaders in churches. It's a, it's a, a joint effort of, of state and religion. That's what you see the beast, the false prophet riding upon. But it says here that both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone in verse 20. Well, if they were cast alive into that lake of fire, it means they're alive until the end. Sometimes we think that, well, if we just pray a little more or if we do a little something different, that somehow things are going to turn around. When I read the scriptures, as we get closer to the day of Christ's coming, we can expect it just to be the opposite. Rather than turning around, we can expect things to get worse until God himself in his time is pleased to cast both into the lake of fire. It'll be, it will be alive and well. Alive and well. And yet that does not deter those that are the Lord's, no matter what era or age that we live in, does not deter us from worshiping our God. You know, they talk about taking prayer out of schools. Well, anybody that's truly the Lord's has never stopped praying. All they've done is taken the formality of prayer away, but they can't keep you or me from addressing our God. And it's not in form, it's not in open public manner. You know, who's to keep me from addressing my God while I'm driving down the road? <laughs> There's no law or legislation or government that's going to keep me from addressing my God. They might try to put us into prison for trying to meet in a public manner like this, but that doesn't hinder God's word. If it's been implanted in your heart, you just take that word to prison with you. You can't hinder God's work by his spirit in the hearts of his people, you see. But the world attempts to. The world continues to try to. But it's a different world. So you can see here these two, the beast and the false prophet, cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And yet... It says here in verse 21, the remnant. Who's the remnant here? You've got the remnant that are the election of grace that the Lord has redeemed that are part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But then you also have the remnant of those that follow the beast. As it says here, that have his mark upon them. And remember again, this is not talking about any one particular individual. That number 666 is the number of man. It has to do with anybody that worships God according to their own works. That has a man-centered faith and not Christ-centered. Unless the Lord grants repentance, it says here, they will be slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. In other words, there's a sure and certain condemnation that awaits any that the Lord Jesus Christ is not redeemed. And then we're going to see one. Remember, there's a trilogy, isn't there? Just like there's a trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, there's a trilogy of evil. The beast, the false prophet, but then there's the dragon. Here we see the beast and the false prophet being cast into the lake of fire, but as we read the rest of the book of Revelation, we come to see where the dragon, Satan himself, will know the same end and be brought to the same ruin. So we're getting down to the end here of this picture, if you will, of history and how God has purposed to glorify his son through it. But in contrast to the blessing of the marriage feast of the Lamb that the chosen and blood-bought, called-out church that the Lord Jesus will enjoy. Here we have this other supper in verse 17. And this is, it's symbolic language. It's designed to describe our Lord's complete victory over his, his enemies to such a degree that all the birds gorge themselves on the flesh of the wicked. I know that's not a very pretty picture when you look at it. I hate to even think about it, but I had to look this up to see, you know, there's birds of prey 
that prey on living animals. They're carnivorous, but there are birds whose one purpose is to prey on dead carcasses. The carrion is what it's called, a carrion bird. It's such things as the buzzard or the condor or the vulture, one even called the swoop, the raven, or the rook. If you ever played rook cards? <laughs> the rook, it's designed to prey on the dead, the crows. These are just a few of, of these common carrions that their one purpose when you see them circling is that there's carcasses. They feed upon those carcasses. I believe all of this is symbolic of the complete destruction of any who worship God according to the flesh. Here's the lesson. You confidence in the flesh? What is the end of all flesh but destruction, death, ruin, you see? And that's what it's designed to show us here, the works of the flesh. If the Lord has not yet delivered you from any type of worship according to the flesh, where it's built upon ceremony and tradition and pictures and idols and, and these sorts of things, then beware. Beware, because the end is destruction. In fact, over in Hebrews chapter 6, this is the language of Scripture. Here were these Hebrews to whom the gospel of Christ had been set forth, and yet some were beginning to show interest again in going back to the law. They became dissatisfied or disinterested in the pure and simple message of Christ and Him crucified, and began to think, well, maybe some part of that law is still important, such as circumcision. Always, all we're going to require is circumcision. It's interesting, different groups require different things whenever you get your eyes off of Christ, different conditions. But it's all the same thing. It's conditional faith, you see. And here in Hebrews 6, the writer says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Let's grow in this foundation of Christ and Him crucified not laying again the foundation of repentance, notice, from dead works. We shouldn't have to be going back again and again laying this foundation that teaches you to repent of dead works, repent of any sort of condition that you might formulate in your mind that you think is necessary in order for God to accept you. That's a laying again of that foundation and of faith toward God. What is faith toward God but that submission to Christ and His righteousness alone is all your hope. And I would hope that there's none here who are still struggling with that, thinking, well, is that really all that's necessary, what Christ did? Because if it is, then you're struggling with your flesh, and that means you're putting some confidence in this flesh and thinking that somehow this flesh can add to what Christ has done and just know that if you stay in that state of mind and heart and the Lord doesn't deliver you, you will perish. You will perish just like all flesh. It's nothing but worms that await you. Ruin. That's really what this whole message is about when you consider that this is the message of the false prophet. This is the message that is popular to that that religion that rides upon the beast of government. It is works religion. It's Cain's religion. It's popular. A lot of popular people involved with it, even movie stars, like to show up at church, so-called, every once in a while, don't they? Show their face. Give, tip the hat to this false prophet, this beast. Ride in on it. Why? Because it honors them. It honors them. And yet, there's nothing but destruction that awaits. But you know, if the Lord does not purge your conscience and mind from pursuing such dead works, then all we know is what awaits is this judgment, this ruin. Over in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, again, when you think of dead works, dead flesh, that's all it is. It's, it's nauseous before a holy God. 
here in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, we learn that it's the very blood of Christ. When that, his death is what that's talking about, is revealed. It says here, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's why I endeavor to keep setting Christ before you. Keep talking about his death. Keep exalting him and his person and his work before your eyes. Because it's going to take the Spirit of God revealing him in your heart. Taking this word and implanting this in your heart. For you to be purged from any thought of any hope in any sort of work of your own. As far as satisfaction before a holy God. So this is where we see the events leading up to this other supper. Let me just give you a, coming back here to Revelation chapter 19. Um, first of all, the time of the great supper. You know, I know that this seems to be far from people's minds right now. Everybody into this holiday season and going here and there and thinking about other things, but we see John here speaking as heaven being opened. You see the contrast here in this particular text beginning with verse 11 as to what we read in Revelation 4 and verse 1 where it's, it spoke of a door opened in heaven. <laughs> here now all of heaven is opened. So it describes here a picture of finality. And I believe what we're reading is the second coming of our Lord. That's what's being described here of him coming on a white horse. All of these other events that we've been reading about are cyclical. Again, the book of Revelation isn't chronological. It's not like everything has led up to this. If you've been following carefully, you understand that we've already seen this described in other portions of Revelation, maybe in some different language, but it's still the same. Same description, for example, back in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6, in verse 14. With the opening of the sixth seal, it says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. When the Lord comes again, it will be the end of time. Peter described us as awaiting the hastening unto the day when the very elements will be dissolved on this earth, you see. So that's what's described here in Kings, verse 15. The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. We're talking about the same end here, just a different way of putting it. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. So here we have the face of him that sitteth on the throne, but it's the same as the one riding the white horse, coming to exercise judgment, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? In other words, who in a false refuge of their own works shall be able to stand. If that's where your hope is, if that's where your confidence is, then know that the end is going to be nothing but the devouring of that particular hope. As we read here in Revelation 19 and verse 18, you see the same types of people described, the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, See, that's a description of people that are pompous and sitting on their, on their religion and having some hope in their own strength and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. So it's a very sobering picture. But that's what's being described. You know, his first coming, Christ's first coming, was not for the judgment of the world. If you look back in John chapter 3, in verse 17. And even now, men and women in false religion, 
can hear a message like this and just say, well, I'm going to go my own way. And they sense a certain amount of freedom in doing so. They can walk out that door. They can go down and find a certain ease in sitting in congregations where they're being flattered and they're being built up and they're being thanked and appreciated for their contributions. And all of these things do nothing but build them up in themselves. But just know that it's only God's patience, His forbearing, as Romans says, with the vessels of wrath that they continue that way. But there's a day coming when that will no longer be the case. There will be no place to hide. No false religion to go to, according to their flesh. But in the meantime, the reason why this has not yet uh, taken place is because there are still those that the Lord is calling out, a people that He's calling out for His name, for whom Christ died. And when Christ came the first time, He made that clear. Look in verse 17 of John 3, where it says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. His first coming did not have as its purpose the condemnation of the wicked, but that the world through Him might be saved. In other words, sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue that he would redeem by his precious blood and in time call out. That's the whole purpose of his first coming. But his second coming, as we see described here, will be for judgment. It will be to make war, even as we read there in verse 11 of Revelation 19. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Don't plug your ears to this message of God's righteousness because you're going to have to deal with it. You'll either have to deal with it in grace because I believe every sinner that the Lord has taught by His grace has been brought to bow to the righteousness of God in Christ. Humbled at Christ's feet and renouncing their own. Or they'll be brought to bow in judgment. But either way, they'll be judged according to this particular righteousness. If you look over in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, and the reason I'm quoting these verses is so that you can see the connectivity between what we're reading here in Revelation and what has already been stated in Scripture. Here Paul preaching on Mars Hill. Isn't this the message that he declared in Acts 17 and verse 31 where it says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. That's who it's all about. So this better be a subject that of all subjects we become familiar with and we study and we make it our earnest desire to learn because this is the standard by which he will judge the world. It's not going to be based on how good you were or how good you think you were. It's going to be all based upon how good he was. Christ in fulfilling righteousness and establishing it. And God declaring sinners righteous based upon his work. You realize that anything outside of that, the scriptures call unrighteousness. I don't care how good men painted up unrighteousness before God and will be destroyed. So that's really what's being described here in Revelation 19. The time of the Great Supper is the end. But here again, look at the victor. The victor at this Great Supper. As it says there in Revelation 19, in verse 11, Behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. You remember when we were first studying here in Revelation chapter 6, in verse 2, we saw this very same picture given here. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Men today can despise the Lord Jesus and the message that exalts him as Lord and Savior, but that doesn't change who he is. He's that one, the victor, who appears sitting on a white horse. And he's called faithful and true. This is a title already revealed to his elect, but yet to be revealed to a reprobate world. And a 
Again, men might take for granted the message of Scripture, giving Christ all the glory, but the day's coming when they'll no longer be able to ignore it. And then his description here is one of a king whose coming means judgment to his enemies. You notice here in Revelation 19 again, verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now you think of judgment as a flame of fire, but that's also a description of wisdom and discernment. Doesn't the Lord know those that are his? You know, this isn't like just coming in and wiping the whole kit and caboodle out and saying, okay, oops, I also destroyed a few of my sheep. Now he knows his sheep. His eyes is a flame of fire discerning the difference between those that are his and those who aren't. We can't tell that. We don't have these eyes. But he does. He knows those that are his. And we see his glory because it says on his head were many crowns. Now again, these are wreaths. And don't think of gold crowns, although that could be a picture. But here, the word that's used is one of a victor's wreath. You've seen them, I think, at the last Olympics. They were handing these out in Greece for those that uh, were first place winners. They were made out of leaves, olive leaves. And you could put many of these on a person's head depending on how, how victorious he was. And that's the picture here, complete victory. That's his glory as Savior. And then his identity in verse 12 where it says he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. A name that no man knew but he himself. I know that he's been revealed to us by many names. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, I shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. When Christ asked Peter, whom do men say that I am? And he said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said, whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Christ, the anointed one of God, the son of the living God. And he said, Peter, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So there are those names that we cherish concerning Christ that are precious to our soul. But as I said earlier, don't think you know everything there is to know about Christ. We have yet to learn. We're looking at him through eyes of depravity still. But oh, to behold him as he is. <laughs> I look for that, that day. And I trust you do too. But his vesture... Notice it's a garment sprinkled with blood. Now be careful here. This is not the blood of the cross. The blood of the cross was shed only for his elect. That's not who's addressed here. This vesture dipped in blood is the very blood of his enemies. That's who's described here. And you talk about how serious he is about the destruction of every one of his enemies. Look at the blood upon his vesture. You see, the blood on his garment that was shed for his church has been shed effectually for their salvation. This blood upon his vesture as a king and a judge will also not be in vain. He was going to destroy every one of his enemies. Why? Well, it says here his name in verse 13 is called the Word of God. The Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's a lot more that could be said here, but the third part of this that I'd have you consider is the description of this great supper. It's not a pretty picture, not one that I'm going to dwell on with you, but nonetheless enough to show you what awaits those who are not the Lord's in that last and terrible day of the Lord. How important is this event? Well, you can see in verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him, upon white horses. This is quite a picture. Our Lord is accompanied by the armies of heaven. It's not for protection for himself. He, he doesn't need these armies for protection, but as a general leading the way in victory. And I believe these are none other than the holy elect angels, as it says in Matthew 25 and verse 31, that accompany him. And because they're holy angels, they're clothed in fine linen, which is white and pure. But also, verse 15, out of his mouth proceeds a sharp sword. 
Again, this is different than the sword of the Spirit used to convert the soul. Here is a symbol of destruction. He comes to smite the nations and shepherd them with a rod of iron. And he comes to carry out the sentence of God Almighty. Again, you can read other portions of Scripture, Matthew 25 particularly, and verses 31 and following that depict the same thing. Verse 16 he now fully reveals himself to the nations as the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's how he's been revealed to your heart and mind if the Spirit has taught us. But then he'll be revealed to the nations. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. And then verses 17 and 18, all flesh, all flesh are effectually summoned you know, unlike the general call of the gospel where people can turn a deaf ear and say, well, maybe another day. You know, I've married a wife and I've got to go be with her. I bought a cow and I've got to go test it and all this stuff that you read in the parables. Uh, here's a summons that cannot be denied. All flesh, great and small. This is the same gathering that has already been described in Revelation 6.15 and again over in chapter 17 and verses 12 and 15. So again, this isn't something new, but it's a picture again of what awaits those that are, are not the Lord's. And then verses 19 to 21, an immense slaughter where every remnant is slain. I know there have been battles where at least one has escaped to go tell of others, but here it says every remnant is slain. And like mere natural catastrophes and wars, famines that have destroyed populations of the earth, and yet some have been spared, here we see a total destruction of those who have worshipped the beast and the false prophet followed them. This again we've seen. This is the great whore. This is the fornication of religion. This is false worship. And all the birds gorge themselves on the flesh of, of the wicked. They consider themselves to be righteous, but it's a righteousness that's self wrought. God declares it to be wicked. And here's the end of all who bear the mark of the beast. All, every last one, will go down to defeat. It's not going to be like, well, I've given the opportunity, I can defend myself. You've been justifying yourself all your life. That is no justification before God. The only justification before God is what does Christ say of you? And if he doesn't own you, if you were not one of his blood-bought people, then this is the certain end that you will face. So this is a scene that is horrific. I admit it. I admit to it, it won't bring one sinner to repentance. You might be sitting there shaking right now thinking, wow, what a horrible thing that awaits. But I'll guarantee you, as soon as you walk out that door, unless the Spirit of God has done a word of grace in your heart, you're going to be right down thinking about other things again, going right on down that road like nothing was, and left to yourself be drawn again into that worship of a false base, you see. But to the redeemed, it's a reminder of just the Lord's saving mercies. That's what I think about. Who am I that the Lord should ever deliver such a one as me? And to know that I've been delivered from such great wrath by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's all my righteousness. And that's our rest. That's our rest. And I pray that you do as well. All right.